thank you for bearing with us while we got set up there. We're slowly getting faster at this. It's only 10 minutes late, I think, tonight, so it's better than the last time. Our regular AV guy should be back next month, too, so you won't have to put up with me doing this. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, this is Exchange.js. It is February. We've got two awesome talks for you tonight. Uh, I will explain what they are in a few minutes. But thank you for braving the cold and the hockey parking and everything else to get here tonight. So we appreciate that. It's good to see everybody. We have um, a couple things that we like to do. One of the big things is to start off with introductions. We try to keep these pretty quick, um, but the idea is that we're here to meet other people in the community. And this is a really quick, really simple way to do that. So we've got a couple mics. Maybe raise your hands if you guys have a mic in front of you just so we know where they are right now. Okay, so we're gonna start with you guys. Maybe we'll start in that corner. And uh, we'll just pass the mic around. Uh, every month we try to have a different question. So um, we'll start with your name. I'm assuming most people know that. And then this month's question is, what inspires you most in your work? So that can be, you know, whether it's a project that you particularly admire, whether it's a, a company or a designer or a particular product, um, or maybe, you know, it's just something else, something that really motivates you and, and gets you going when you're working on a project. Um, you know, so for me, I, as much as I'm a kind of Google guy in terms of the toys that I have and stuff like that, I've actually always been really uh, inspired by Apple. I just think they do such a good job taking technology and making it accessible to everybody. So I would say they're probably one of the companies that really inspires me for their ability to do that. Um, and my name is Mark Bennett, in case you didn't know. So <laughs> Nathan, why don't we start with you over there? I'll pick on you. Um, yeah, maybe we'll pass you the mic too so we can hear you later. <laughs> so the question is, what's your name and what inspires you? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Here, why don't we, I think we have another microphone over here. We can just pick it up right there. Is that going?
a user to do that for us. Everybody see that? Yeah, this is for recording. Yeah. Why don't you pass it back over there because it's kind of over there. Great. Okay. Well, I think I think we got everybody there. Do we have any stragglers that snuck in at the last minute? I think we're good. Okay. Oh, well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm always interested to kind of hear people's answers to those questions. They're often uh, pretty enlightening in terms of what uh, you know what people are doing and what kind of interests them and stuff. So thank you. Uh, if you don't have it already, uh, there is a card I think on some of the tables too with this. But uh, there is free Wi-Fi here. They changed the password. It's Warehouse 12 now with a capital W. So if you need that, you've got it. Uh, the next meetup reminder is March 1st. So, and I think we're going to be talking about the JavaScript event loop. I don't know if we got to confirm. Yeah, okay. Um, a reminder that we do have a code of conduct. Basically, the idea is don't be jerks to people. And um, we will be recording and sharing it on YouTube. So, I guess don't say anything you don't want shared on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> but otherwise, uh, it's all pretty self explanatory. It's up on our website too if you want to read the whole thing. Uh, we've got two good talks tonight. Uh, the first one is going to be Juan G, and he's going to be talking about Lambda Calculus uh, and functional programming. And uh, this is what I'm really looking forward to. Uh, and then the next one we have up tonight is uh, Ben, Ben Zitlau. And he's going to be talking, the title is Trying to Offline the Online, but I believe it's actually talking about service workers, right? Yeah, so that should be pretty good too. I've seen the notes and that looked pretty neat. So, um, Discussion tonight is not security. I think I forgot to update that slide. We're going to be talking uh, about working with new technology. So, um, you know, whether that's working with JavaScript or like things like in terms of your, app, your application, in terms of your data layer, uh, in terms of all the different kind of things that uh, we have coming at us and changing at a constant uh, pace. You know, how do you integrate those? How do you still service all the browsers and stuff like that? So that's going to be the discussion tonight. 
Uh, in terms of jobs, we have a couple new jobs up on the jobs board tonight. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out lately, it's uh, exchange.com slash jobs. Uh, I would go take a look at that. Uh, there are definitely still people hiring on there. Uh, we have a couple of things that haven't closed either too. So apply now. <laughs> You'll get uh, opportunities for sure. Uh, could you guys just raise your hand if you are looking for work right now? Okay, so we have a couple people. Um, and let's do the other thing. Now don't we raise hands if we're looking for people to do work. Okay, so people looking for work, find the people looking for people to do work after the meetup is over, please. Uh, okay, and so let's get into the jokes. I'll stop talking and we'll let one come up first. Thank you. It's, it's actually interesting. I'm trying to think of a case where there was something that was taken out. Actually, having a, having a tough time thinking of cases. So I'll more talk to the other side of it, which is something um, new coming in. And um, like one one of the nice environments we have is like right now we do our mobile app, which is a hybrid app. So it's a web view inside the app. So that's kind of nice because we have a lot more control over the browser that it's running inside of. So we can use more modern uh, features as long as they're available in the, in the browsers that we're bundling in there. Um, and then for the web. Um, Google Analytics is, is actually a really useful tool to just go and see like what percentage of my user base is on a browser that has access to that feature and, and that drives a lot of our conversations. So we kind of have like rules of thumb of like browser versions we support. Um, but aside from that, like, and even that is largely driven by looking at Google Analytics and, and getting a sense of like what our user base looks like. And it's interesting, I've, I've seen some pretty big variances across different products too. So. Um, I think there'd be some danger if you're just looking at industry benchmarks and assuming those match your customer base, where your customer base might look different. So, sort of like what Ben was talking about, just like that we have a JavaScript running mobile app that's wrapped like natively. There's some older versions of Android. It's not quite like browser grading. grading. I had never heard that term before, but I understand what it means. Um, uh, but like older versions of Android run like a really old version of Chrome. And like we support that version, but there's some features on it that just we don't support for that. So it's like if you want those, you're going to have to upgrade. I think we just, it, it's, it's just not available. Like they don't see like errors or something like that. It's just not present for them. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's only for a few things, but yeah. Yeah, I've never heard it described so uh, precisely of categories of browsers support, but definitely I mean, I don't work on a large scale project where I'm maintaining something like that, but this idea that, okay, you're gonna try and have all key functionality in the latest versions of the major browsers, you know, aesthetic things I might throw in, you know, blend modes, even if it doesn't look quite the same, but functionality everywhere. And then for like, Okay, and for IE 11, it's got to at least be functional, even if that means uh, falling back to uh, something that's a, a basic HTML experience instead of a more complicated script revision experience or whatever.
it's a good idea. I think actually browser stack is has a feature to accommodate something like that, and then it's really handy because like um, I recommend something like browser stack anyway to automate your like HTML CSS kind of like check. It's just a quick way to just check like going down each grade of browser uh, from IE 10, 11, 9, whatever. Um, uh, that's the one that just shows you what the web page renders like on old browser versions. And then you can just quickly check mark which one you want. And it's also really good because they do uh, mobile as well. So you can get the mobile browsers. And then you can also, instead of just browser version, you can actually specify which uh, device model. So if it's like you want to target Samsung Galaxy S6, you want to see what your web page looks like on that. So you can do this or that or whatever. But just uh, to like test that stuff, like generally I kind of just... We'll do a, an overview uh, of a web page based uh, and look at the output of those kind of things, and then um, just like slap in. I know it's like kind of sometimes some people say bad practice to use the feature or browser version detection, but if you just throw that logic in there, you can have a really nice page and then just dumb it down the slower or the more versions lower you go. I just want to add a bit to the browser stack. Uh, so yeah, they do have this feature, and furthermore, you can have a, you can run your end-to-end -end tests on the server side for the browser stack, so on their servers automatically, and you can be as specific as you want. So you can like essentially direct all your end-to-end -end tests there and get a result automatically, and you can like use this in your pipelines as well when you like build or deploy. So that's neat. Yeah. Exactly. You don't even need to look at the pages. Browser stack does it for you. On their servers. Correct. Yeah, it's like an end-to-end -end test where you can like specify like I want to see if the is as simple as like the page loads. There's the body tag, or as complicated as I want to see that in Internet Explorer nine, there is this field that has this parameter and whatnot. And uh, in terms of like how big companies, like some of the bigger companies handle um, browser support, I feel like a lot of the time it comes down to math where they just look at maybe a Google Analytics or they would have their own analytics and they would see, oh yeah, so we have 2% of IE9 and that comes down to like 2% of our revenue is like 1 million dollars a year. So that's okay, we might as well like keep a few more developers who would like they would have some pain with it, but they would be able to figure it out, support it, we're gonna have the money. But it's like half a percent, uh, maybe not. So it comes down to figuring it out. Yeah. I was... be, is that better? Maybe I flip my switch down. Oh, not on that one, no. That's, that one will just get the audience. Yeah. Are you seeing the little bar moving? That's the best thing I've seen. Do you see the bar moving? Okay. Yeah, now is it moving? Yeah, okay. All right, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to be so glad when our AV guy comes back. <laughs> I was going to say one of the things that we do, and it's not a formal program or anything, but mm. we have a number of developers that just use different browsers. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So like right now, I'm using Firefox. I haven't mm -hmm. had a while since Quantum. Yep. Obviously, a lot of developers using Chrome mm -hmm. um, and a few using Safari. And yep. like, you know, it's not a replacement for having automated tests, but mm -hmm. there's some real value to it because no matter how good your automated tests are or your integration tests are, right. just the fact that you're a developer, like seeing your product and in there every day, you're going to catch mm -hmm. things that like even with all that automation, you wouldn't catch. So right. it's kind of a nice thing that like if people happen to like different browsers or have an interest in trying a different browser, like on a team, mm -hmm. so you're not all using the exact same browser, there can be some real value to it. Right. Okay. Um, oh, uh, funny thing though is we all use Macs, so nobody's really testing Internet Explorer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I maybe another thing that I know I've hit, and this was kind of where I got thinking with this is 
I was working on a project and I heard what it was I was upgrading, but to upgrade um, to the newer version, I had to upgrade a whole bunch of like other dependencies and things like that. And when I did that, there was, you know, deprecated features that weren't working. And so it actually like to upgrade this one package, it turned out there was quite a bit of work I had to do in my code base to handle the deprecations. And it was my fault. Like this app hadn't been updated in probably like three years. So I, you know, I can't blame anyone but myself for not doing that. But I was wondering, like, do people have something where you go and, like, you know, look at your outdated packages regularly to see? Or, like, again, do you wait until you need, like, a new feature? Or? Uh, yeah, so uh, I have some experience upgrading Ember apps. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the first problem was we originally waited, like, a bit too long to do it, so we had upgraded everything that came with it. Right. All the add-ons that should be supported by the latest Ember version. Mm -hmm. um, we do use... We have some things we've put in place. We use something called Gymnasium. Mm -hmm. There's other things out there now. GitHub has support for similar things yeah. that watches like your packages. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it, you know, it's not only used for things that are out of date, but also security vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you have to opt into that? Do you, I can't remember. Like, I think. GitHub yeah. I remember I had to turn it on. Yeah. 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 That's I, pretty I awesome. Only though. Personally looked into it because Gymnasium was being. Yeah. But yeah, uh, that's like the biggest thing. Like mm -hmm. just having something that monitors that lets you know, like just it also gives you notifications for when things are out of date, mm -hmm. or you can set it for a different, like if there's minor versions or major versions and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Right. So uh, right. honestly, I think the easiest thing is just to have something that lets you know, so you can keep up keep to up date, to date. Yeah. or else you know, just it makes more work for yourself. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay. Um, I just want to see what else I have in my slides here. On a pet peeve related to that, mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, when you're when you're working on like a package JSON file or a gem file in Ruby land, um, it can be very tempting to specify the specific version as the current version. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem with that is that then when someone else goes to update and is trying to figure out the dependencies, there's this like hard coded dependency, and you don't know why that's hard coded. Like, does this right. actually need to be locked to this? So like, like trying to learn the different kind of like semver. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like basically that this I don't even know what you call that the numerology, like the different symbology. I don't know. Right. But basically, the syntax for specifying, you know, the 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 range that you're actually willing to work with, right, um, can reduce a lot of pain down the road for someone else because when they go to update those libraries, it can just resolve to a more recent version, right, um, within those constraints. So. So avoid specifying the specific, you know, patch version unless you really need that specific patch version yeah. to save someone else um, some pain. Yeah, I know I've been bit by that with like not even in my package file, but like in something that my package depends on. They'll like specify a fixed version, and like again, like for no clear reason why, and like even just upgrading theirs, maybe it doesn't like let you have like a newer dependency. So you're trying to update something like, and you know it's outdated and it's outdated in your project, but you can't figure out why. And it just turns out like, hey, there's another dependency that's locking at an older version. So I know we've run into that before too. Just as a quick counterpoint to that, mm -hmm. literally this morning we had a, so our package.json is set up with the hat symbol in front, the any, any minor version is acceptable. Mm -hmm. One of the libraries overnight updated uh, theirs and broke everything. So come in this morning, all the builds are failing. Uh, so you can have literally the opposite problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and just to rip, rip off that a bit, I, one of the things that I, I sort of practice, I started doing was always adding comments in for when, when that happens, you lock it to, and you lock it to a specific version, adding a comment that says why that's locked to a specific version. Mm -hmm. And that works pretty well in like most package managers. I'm not sure how well it works in package JSON if you can put comments in or not. Um, but it's mm -hmm. definitely yeah. having a reason why it's locked to a version. Yeah. I well, I know too, like every once in a while I've had to fork something and like use like a GitHub repo that has a patch applied to it or something instead of the official one. So then I always like have a little comment being like, Mark, like check this in like three months to see if it's been merged. Or like, you know, I'll try to put, if there's an issue that is on the real one, I'll try to link to the issue and be like, when this closes, switch away from your crazy version. So. Honestly, we use a lock file because at some point it showed up. <laughs> mm -hmm. And 
and and and, and you, you you look it up and says, oh, you should you should commit this. It's like, cool. <laughs> I think block files are a good compromise though, because like in your, you know, in your actual dictionary file, you're you're not saying you need a specific thing, but until you yeah. actually go out of your way to start installing new dependencies, like you you go to update some other or install some other uh, package or gem, like it's going to keep using that lock file until mm -hmm. stuff changes. So it's, it's kind of a nice balance between the two where to yeah. put in. Uh, lock files have been a great addition in the past few years, let's just say that. Yeah. It also makes it, doesn't it make it faster like when you're first installing your packages because it can kind of skip resolving stuff and then just yeah. start downloading. Yeah. It also helps like people on a dev team have the same version, which is nice. Uh -huh. um, where before we had these sort of Loosely defined, like package.json or, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, it'd be very easy for somebody to hit a weird bug because they're like two minor versions ahead and then you're trying to, try to figure out like why the behavior is different in theirs versus yours. Or, I don't see this bug, it's not a bug, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess one thing too is like if you are making a package that people depend on, there's that whole like semantic versioning thing, and I'm still like mixed up sometimes about when the rules are for like changing the different numbers. But like I always thought it was like if one of the major number changes, like expect like breaking code and like APIs can disappear. You know, usually the second one is the one that I'm the most confused about because it's like sometimes stuff will break, but usually it should be okay to like update those ones. And then like I always assume pretty much that the third one is gonna to be okay and like they're just bug fixes or things like that um but yeah like if you're writing a library that's one of those things where i don't know i guess just decide like how you want to handle that and be really clear so people know when it's upgrading um so we talked a bit about supporting older clients and web browsers um i guess this was one thing too like do people actually set aside any time to do the upgrading? Like, do you guys have like, okay, it's like the last Friday of the month or something, or, you know, like do teams have something where it's like, I'm going to fix my projects and keep them up to date. Cause I, I know for me, like if I don't do that, I just don't do that ever usually. And then it's like not done until there's a problem. Um, and so I promised myself I would do this. I sometimes like, I, I'm sure our exchange JS one is like completely out of date on so many things. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm just curious, like, do people have something where they go, like, you were talking about using gymnasium and, like, probably, like, it sounds like maybe doing those as they come. But do other people have different ways of doing, like, do, do you set aside a time every month or every week or? No. <laughs> uh, um, uh, this is kind of one other thing, and maybe this isn't the right way to ask this question, but what I was trying to get at is like, I definitely have some apps where I probably will never upgrade them. Like, like unless there's like a security issue or something like that, like the value that you get out of the app is not something where it's worth like putting in the time to like add a new feature or like, you know, integrate with a new feature or something like that. I'm just wondering, you know, how do people decide or make that decision in a project? Like when do you decide, ah, it's good enough? Or is it ever like, you know, you just always want to keep it up to date and things. You wait till it breaks. <laughs> There's a new application paradigm. I, maybe someone might know what it is, but it's like the thinking is, is like give the user the right to upgrade when they want to. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a sort of like, um, maybe even like a cryptographic technique for allowing them to, or it's maybe using something like secure scuttlebutt or something where um, uh, you can sort of, man the user can manage their own versions securely without allowing the application to override it because the problem is like say you have a web application and you really like that web application say it's gmail um gmail can push in js update anytime and then like you lost that feature you really like but mm -hmm. there's a technique now where people are engineering ways to just sort of freeze the application entirely mm -hmm. and then when a new update comes down the pipeline you can you can choose so interesting so it like saves the javascript like in yeah. one instant kind of yeah huh i don't know if that's like scary or awesome <laughs> Yeah, it could fragment a lot of your users if they start doing that. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, I've, I've tried to do this in a few cases where I have an app and it, you know, it just works fine how it is. I don't feel like I need any changes to it. Mm -hmm. um, but just what I'm finding is in the modern ecosystem, like even just the fact that you have you know, your package JSONs and you have your, your gem files, but you don't actually have those libraries like bundled with the repo and um, 
you know, the, the system libraries, like, like any time I've gone down that path, mm -hmm. it like, it, it's a matter of time, eventually it's going to break and it's just going to not work and you're either going to have to take on that cost of upgrading it or just, so right. like basically the only time I can get away with not upgrading something is if I'm just like, oh, when it breaks, I'll just throw it out. Right. Um, anything else, I just, it doesn't, at some point it's going to stop working. So how would you do that? Could you take like, like for Node, would you take like the Node modules folder and like just kind of regularly like back that up like outside of Git or something? Or like how would you handle, you know, that dependency on these external dependencies? You could try, but even like your Node version at some point is not going to work. Mm -hmm. Like again, right. like, I, like I, I, would, I don't have an approach that I try to do to try and extend that. Like basically if I'm in that mode, it has to be something that I'm willing to let break, or right. or I'm just procrastinating that pain, and when it breaks, I'll, I'll make the investment. Deal with it, then. I just have not been able to decide not to upgrade something and not get burned by it. Right. Okay. I don't know if this is a very satisfying answer to that, but we have a lot of very old stuff uh, mm -hmm. at Investopedia, mm -hmm. and one technique we, we kind of use is uh, right now we're building on a new tech stack. We're going to migrate over the pages that make most of our money mm -hmm. and then kind of take the cost of maintaining the old servers, the old infrastructure, mm -hmm. take that to the business, say, this is how much this costs us every month. Mm -hmm. How much do we make on all these other pages? Mm -hmm. And that's effectively like, a, are we just going to turn this off or do you really care about having us rewrite these things and how much time we're going to spend on it? Right, right. That's Which a good is, way to do it. It's not a super constructive way of doing it, but it's kind of been the only, you know, if we have something sitting there, it makes us, you know, ten thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. on ads. They're they're gonna say, oh yeah, we need to keep it. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, well then we need to rewrite it. And they're gonna say, well no, we don't want to spend the dev time on that. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the only way we found to really get rid of things well, like that. When getting rid of features is actually like really hard. Like it's like it's you know one thing to like add features to your product, but like going the other way and like having something and like justifying taking something that people are actively using out of a product is really hard to do because like you know you're gonna be upsetting someone for like. You know, because if like, there are obviously users using it, yeah. but at the same time, sometimes it makes sense just so that you know you can make your product simpler, or make it more maintainable, and stuff like that. So that, I don't. Know, I think that's a pretty good argument for doing that. That makes sense to me. Um, were there any other kind of things that people wanted to to add, or maybe we'll wrap this up then? All right. Okay. So we're going to say a couple quick thank yous. Um, as always, we wanted to say thank you to Jobber. Uh, they guys have, have been great supporters of us throughout the years. Um, as well, uh, Investopedia, you guys have been good supporters of us this year and we appreciate it. So uh, also Startup Edmonton, they uh, are always uh, good about providing a space and Wi-Fi and things like that. So um, reminder, next meetup, March 1st. Uh, next hack up is the uh, code next story is February 20th. Uh, it's a Tuesday, not a Wednesday. So put that in your calendars. Uh, we'll be talking about the JavaScript event loop in March as well. We do have another talk. I cannot remember what it is right now. I think did Michelle leave already. I think he was doing the talk. So anyway, we'll have more details about that as we get closer to the event. Um, we're always looking for more speakers. We're actually starting to look for more demos here. We usually have a demo night uh, around May uh, where you come up, you do like a five, maybe 10 minute demo. There's no slides allowed. Um, and it is that you're just showing code and something cool that's working. And last year we had little trophies and prizes and things like that. So it worked pretty well. We're going to do that again. It was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, so if you want to win Austin prizes, um, then it's time to start thinking about what you want to demo. And we promise we'll be nice too. So <laughs> don't feel like you have to have something perfect. Um, if you want, you can follow us on YouTube and Twitter. And that is it. So we'll go try to find drinks, I guess, if we can get into the Mercer. Thanks, everybody. Exchange JS is Edmonton's JavaScript meetup. Thanks to our sponsors, Jobber and Investopedia. Support the meetup and like and share this video. And stay informed by following us on Twitter and meetup.com. Links in the description. See you soon!